My name is Paul Shelley, and welcome to The Astro Historian. This is a channel dedicated to exploring and explaining the lore of sci-fi and space universes and discussing their impact. Today we'll be talking about one of the most contentious ships in the Star Citizen universe, and its shady past, the T3 slash T8 Gladiator. I'd also like to thank y'all for your continued support. We're over 18,000 subscribers, and that is all thanks to y'all spreading the word. So if you've been enjoying the lore content here, then please hit that subscribe button and the bell icon to be notified when these are released. If you still haven't gotten Star Citizen somehow, think about using my referral code on screen now for 5,000 extra UEC when you get the game. With that said, let's learn about how a scam turned into the first carrier bomber in UEE history. The story of the Gladiator starts with a new development firm founded in 2889 called Craig Levine Accelerator. This team gave a highly classified briefing to the UEE Navy about their breakthrough in creating the next generation's weapon system they called the Multi-Vector Torpedo, or MVT. This system was so advanced that it was nearly invisible to sensors and could skip through shields, entirely bypassing them to utterly annihilate the target. Needless to say, the Navy was very intrigued with this idea. The catch was that the MVT required a specialized laser target system that the firing ship would have to maintain a lock with up until the detonation. At the time, no ship was capable of both firing torpedoes and also loiter that close to an enemy without being in serious danger. So the Navy diverted tens of millions of credits to Craig Levine to build the prototype, and the Navy tagged perennial favorite Anvil Aerospace to design a brand new delivery vehicle for the MVT. This ship had to be small enough to possibly avoid detection close up, but large enough for the torpedo and the sensor. The result was the T-3A. This ship had a length of 22.5 meters, a height of 6 meters, and a width of 22.5 meters, making it only slightly wider than the Hornet, and thus could operate out of the same carrier ships as its older sibling. It was operated by a crew of two, but this is where the records become a bit hazy for reasons I'll elaborate on later. It is possible that the second seat of the ship was set aside to act as a targeting operator for the laser guidance of the MVT. It could also have been simply a gunner seat, as the ship was designed to operate dangerously close to larger ships that were the target of the MVT. Either way, the T-3A was designed from the beginning with fighter-bomber carrier operations in mind, as the pilot had two size 3 weapon mounts, as well as an array of other offensive missiles. The ship was ready to go with up to 28 production prototypes finished around the start of the first test of the MVT in 2894. It was then that the truth of this new wonder weapon was revealed to be entirely fake. The weapon delivered was a non-functional warhead stacked with off-the-shelf components that didn't do anything in particular. The whole thing was a scam, though likely a well-meaning one based on the reaction of the UEE and Craig Levine. Craig Levine may have been sincere in their belief that the NVT could work, but their pitch got ahead of the reality of the situation, and as such, when it came time to deliver the weapon, they scrambled to deliver something to satisfy the UEE. The Navy was so embarrassed by the situation that they opted to entirely cover up the event, destroying anything that had to do with the MVT or the T-3A. Thus, the ambiguous understanding of the role of the second seat of the ship. They went so far as to order the targeting units that had already been installed on the prototypes to be destroyed, and didn't even allow Anvil to keep the schematics of the original design. Though Craig Levine was not punished, the company never returned to the public light. This left the UE with 28 completed ships and 144 ordered ships, which were already in production and had no more use for them. Instead of canceling the project, the Navy opted to try and salvage the millions of black funds, likely to try and prevent any of their failures to leak to the Senate and open them up to public examination. While it's not clear, the actions seem to mirror those of the admirals who created the Carrick a few years before, who also seem to be attempting to keep political pressure off of them for their failures. For more context on that, I'd suggest watching our video on the Carrick and its cursed creation in the top right. This would make sense, as those admirals involved with the Carrick were not exposed and ousted until the late 29th or early 30th century. 
and considering the monumental failures of command during the 29th century, including the stunning loss of Caliban to the Vanduul in 2884 and the destruction of the UES Flysa on Daymar, it is likely the same leadership. This alone is worthy of its own video, examining the failures of the early UEE military and how it struggled to find its place in the post measure era, while relying on leaders who were politically but not militarily savvy. However, for now, just understand that the Gladiator is but one of a number of failures the UEEN leadership had at the time. This left Anvil in charge of turning a ship that was built for a very specific purpose to one of a more nebulous variety, notably to fill the role between long-range bomber and fighter, all while being tasked with using parts from the extensive Retaliator fleet, a ship designed by an entirely different company, to do it. As a testament to Anvil engineering skills, this task was done in just under four months. This led to a ship that was now able to carry a variety of weapons on its exterior pylons, from missiles to rockets and possibly bombs, while supporting a concealed bay capable of housing four torpedoes. The cherry on top was the bay was modular and able to be swapped out with any number of changes that could fit into the area. Thanks to Anvil, the UEE had its first ever true carrier bomber, the T-8A Gladiator, thus adding a tremendous amount of firepower to the Navy in a small compact package. The trouble was the UEE Navy didn't really know what to do with it. At first, the UEE treated it as a ship that could defend itself like a fighter, and thus was a bomber that didn't need fighter escort. This may be because the ship it was replacing, the Typhoon Dive Bomber, may have had no means of self-defense, as it was an aging, likely Aegis-designed ship designed under older doctrines of combat proven to be ineffective against the Van Duel. Still, because the UEE Navy, especially frontline commanders, had no idea how to effectively use the ship, they instead treated it as a washout assignment. Pilots that couldn't hack it in a Gladius or Hornet were dumped into Gladiator squadrons with little to no training. This toxic mix of washout pilots and misunderstood capabilities led to disaster by 2905, as there were no fewer than six disastrous encounters in which inexperienced and unprotected Gladiator pilots were slaughtered by the Van Duel, including one incident in which an entire squadron of 12 was wiped out by just four scythes leaving a single turret gunner to survive the encounter and report back. It got so bad that pilots were refusing to accept gladiator assignments, seeing them as death sentences. This led to a spiral of less and less experienced pilots being ordered to gladiators and valuable bombing experience wasted. By 2908, the Navy knew that their use of the ship was not working. It was here when I believe the old Admiralty was finally ousted in disgrace, possibly due to the utter failure of the early Gladiator program. Now under new leadership, T-8A pilots began new experimental training. Pulling pilots from Retaliators and Hornets to act as instructors and talent scouts, a new generation of Gladiator pilots were recruited and trained to operate as the new light bomber role. Then, when these pilots returned with experience in the field, many were pulled to act as trainers for the next generation of pilots thus allowing for a unique skill of flying the T-8 to be passed down. This process revealed that despite its dodgy history, the Gladiator was an incredible ship. It was durable, flexible, and could keep pace with what Gladiator pilots affectionately called their big brother, the F-7A Hornet. Its role grew over time as pilots learned just how many roles it could fill with ease. Those roles included, but were not limited to, strategic space-to-ground bombing runs, support for long-range squadron missions, modified CNC and target assignment for multi-squadron combat scenarios, aggressive environmental recalibration, capital ship torpedo strikes, stealth operations, supply drops through enemy-controlled territory, blockade running, target interception, and even search and rescue. The pilots who flew the T-8A were often paired with F-7A pilots for missions, where the F-7A kept their little brothers safe while the gladiators would perform death-defying missions which captivated the public's attention. Stories and pictures of gladiator missions against Vanduul fleets and pirates became incredibly popular in UEE media. One of the stories we know comes from UEE Navy Lieutenant Commander Adio Vota, whose squadron were dispatched to deal with a pirate crew in Odin called the Grawtooth Pack, 
who had taken hostages on a research and development station in Odin. Intel reported that the pirates had a corvette in some asteroids near the station, and Commander Vota was the sole gladiator in a flight of hornets. As Vota recalled, their big brothers were the distraction, while the gladiator was the hammer. As the hornets streaked in first to draw the attention of the defending pirates, the T-8A went hunting for its prey. The issue was, in the chaos, their ship had targeted an old wreck, and not the active corvette. By the time they had realized the mistake, the pirates had discovered the real threat and targeted Commander Vota and their co-pilot. The gladiator took a pounding, but the ship was able to loop around and drop two capital killer torpedoes point-blank, cracking the corvette wide open. Another account was from UEE Marine Captain Anna Kinsley. They were called in to run a relief mission on Hyperion, where hyperclay storms had been raging on the planet for two weeks with no end in sight, and the locals were entirely out of water. Captain Kinsley was a veteran of over 30 combat sorties and gladiators, and their ships were the only ones the Marines had capable of withstanding the pounding storms that plagued the world. Swapping out the torpedo bays for cargo bays, the squadron made their way to the drop point. The captain remarked that within five minutes, their ship was experiencing the most intense turbulence they had ever felt. It was as if the ship was going to be punched into the ground. All the while, there was zero visibility. However, the avionics and flight assist were so well-tuned, they never felt out of control of their ship. As a result, the ships were able to drop their supplies and return to their ship without missing a beat. Stories like these are why the public fell in love with the ship, along with images like this one, an iconic pic taken by UEE Marine Major Taya Wallen. The then Lance Corporal was returning to the secretive Marine base on Corin after a six-hour, grueling zero-g boarding training exercise on May 28, 2933, when she spotted these gladiators on the launch pad of the icy planet. The squadron was in the process of transferring to a Marine vessel headed for an undisclosed combat zone. While many cite the grain and contrast as contributing to the immediacy of the moment, the pilots are the truly striking aspect of this picture. There is a serenity as they wait to launch into what we can imagine is certain danger. It serves as a testament to the focus and training of the men and women who serve in the UEE Marines and their complete trust in their gladiators. It remains one of the only images ever allowed to the public of the highly classified base. While all of this attracted the attention of the public, the true poster children of the Gladiator is Squadron 214, specifically Bravo Flight, or as the public best knows them, the Black Crows. Squadron 214 is what's known as a multi-level force applicator in the Navy. This means the squadron is equipped with multiple types of craft for the unit, some more specialized than others. The squadron was formed in 2675 as part of the military revival after the close of Project Farstar, and since then it has had seven Medal of Imperial Valor winners on its roster, and credited with the destruction of a dreadnought, four battleships, nine carriers, and countless lesser ships. The squadron got its infamous name when, under the command of Captain Charlotte Branton, the pilots of Bravo Flight famously were able to score the first perfect score on a hard plus rated simulated bombing run. This earned them the name Branton's Braggarts because they wouldn't shut up about it, and got the ground crews to begin painting black birds on their spacecraft as a sign of distaste for 214's constant cawing. However, the Black Crow name would come after 2681 when the squadron was put on the Vanduul front, where they distinguished themselves as being especially effective against the alien menace, earning them the moniker the Black Crows, or the more crass, bloodthirsty birds, as many UEE military refer to them as. Since then, they have been cursed to be on the front lines of combat with the Van Duel, often performing incredible feats of valor, only to see the systems they fought tooth and nail to defend slip out of their grasp. This made the squadron adaptable and well-known as holding a grudge, embracing the Earth Crow's infamous long memory that allowed it to remember faces so well that they can attack offenders years after an incident. Their unofficial motto might as well be, we won't forget. The Vanduul has become the eternal enemy of Squadron 214, and Bravo Flight has found the Anvil T-8A Gladiator to be the perfect instrument for delivering that vengeance. This would culminate when Bravo Flight was attached to a UEE battle group guarding the Virgil Jump Point to Vega and assigned to the UES Typhon, when, on the morning of August 9th, 2932, the battle group went to action stations. 
On the Typhon, word spread that Virgil's aging early warning satellite network had relayed a distress signal, a military distress signal, from somewhere in the Virgil system. Admiral Bonds, the commanding officer, had requested permission to jump the entire battle group into the Virgil system to investigate, but was ordered by High Command to abandon any investigation. They were concerned about a remote sensor system that had identified a 55% probable chance that a Vanduul clan was in the system's environs, and the High Command didn't want to risk personnel or materials investigating a system that had been devoid of human life for a century. The morale on board the Typhon was rock bottom after the news. Here was a military rescue beacon deep in the heart of a site of one of the Empire's bloodiest defeats. The Starmen of Bravo Flight reasoned that, at best, High Command were letting a fellow pilot die, and at worst, they were ignoring an opportunity to settle a very specific age-old score with the Van Duel. You see, the 214 was one of the last squadrons to pull out of Virgil when it fell, with many of its number volunteering to stay behind to cover the retreat. So, entirely against orders, flight leader Tam Thaxon gathered Bravo Flight and the deck crew, who all agreed to break ranks and risk court-martial to come to the aid of those in need on the other side of the jump point. They then secretly readied their six gladiators to launch with the help of the Typhoon's deck officer, all with stealth configurations, three with autodocs and search and rescue configurations, while the other three retained their torpedo loadout. Thaxton wrote a delay message to his commanding officer, and famously stated, we won't forget, before firing up their T-8As and launching with full calm silence. As Bravo Flight passed UEE tracking stations, they were prepared to meet resistance, only to be met with encouragement and well wishes on their mission. Thus, they were able to enter the jump point without an issue. Once in Virgil's space, the crows were able to triangulate the signal and determine it to be coming from the surface of one of the innermost planets. Opting to use more fuel, Thaxton wanted to avoid the direct route and risk being ambushed by any duel between them and the planet. Unfortunately, this was the wrong call, as they managed to fly directly into a Vandal patrol of four scythes and a command and communication ship. The battle was short but fierce, as the gladiators loaded with torpedoes destroyed the CNC ship before it could call for reinforcements, and the rest dealt with the scythes. Bravo Flight came out victorious, but at the loss of Bravo 3 and the gunner Paul Ransom, killed by a ramming scythe, thus forcing the pilot to do a dangerous combat EVA to Bravo 5, who was equipped with an SNR module. The rest of the flight was able to reach the now silent signal, which the team had traced to within a few feet of its location, somewhere on the planet's equatorial zone. Thaxton touched down near the source, while the rest of Bravo Flight provided makeshift combat patrol, and there he found the remains of a Wildcat Deep Space fighter in a clearing, where its impact had knocked down several of Virgil's giant trees. Investigating the wreck, he discovered a pair of human skeletons, one in a tattered flight suit, both wearing Black Crow patches, revealing that what he had found was a lost Squadron 214 ship that had gone down against the Van Duel many years before. Eventually, Thaxton discovered the source of the signal, the Wildcat's black box recorder, apparently reactivated in a recent lightning strike. After retrieving the black box, he buried the bodies, making sure to take their dog tags so they could be formally returned to Killian. He then stowed the black box on his gladiator and took off, rejoining the rest of Bravo Flight and returning to Vega, fearing that they had failed in their mission and were returning to their certain court-martial. To their surprise, as they returned to Vega, they were greeted as heroes. You see, since their flight, word had spread to the public at large who had turned against the opinion of the High Command, especially after word of the famous Squadron 214 rejecting the orders and going in anyways. Thus, the crew was not only spared being kicked out of the Navy in possible jail time, but feted as incredible heroes for having helped put a small part of the still freshly remembered dark days of the fall of Virgil to an end. More incredibly, the black box revealed that the starmen whom Bravo Flight had discovered had volunteered to stay behind and cover the retreat with the rest of the UEE forces and civilians in the system, fighting to the last moment to give them as much time as possible to flee to Vega, thus bringing another tale of 214's heroism to the forefront. While these daring tales of heroism spilled into the public conscious, very little of the dark origins of the ship, or its tribulations after the rework, ever made it to the limelight. 
Instead, the ship was catapulted into iconic status, as its silhouette was used in popular entertainment, especially in a starring turn in the movie titled Flight of the Gladiator. So as older gladiators were rotated out of service, they began to find themselves in the civilian market. These were not purpose-built for civilians, but converted military models, and often found themselves on the frontier. Particularly popular were the firefighting conversions, with their torpedo bays replaced with liquid tanks for fighting planetary fires. Until the 2920s, the military resisted allowing militia forces to even be able to buy high-yield torpedoes, insisting that those munitions were the purview of the fleet. However, as the public demand for more and more quick reaction forces to head off Vandal raids intensified, the policy was pulled back, and Anvil was finally allowed to develop a civilian model of the now iconic bomber. Named the T-8C, it launched in 2943, and immediately proved more popular than the ship did in military circles. Civilian organizations began adapting the flexible ship for everything from strike operations to armored personnel carriers. This popularity would even draw the ire of the founder of Consolidated Outland, Silas Kerner, who would call the Gladiator a half-assed toy for full-grown men to play fighter hero. Despite the disapproval of the billionaire, the ship remained popular. Anvil continued to upgrade both versions of the ship, particularly in terms of what systems are accessible to the radar operator slash turret gunner. One company on Terra offers one-on-one -on -one planetary and local system tour packages with a fleet of four vividly painted gladiators outfitted with a quote-unquote glass bottom camera array in their bomb bays for maximum visibility for the passenger manning the radar operator seat. The Gladiator may have started as the result of a scam, but has evolved to become one of the most recognizable ships of humanity in the 30th century, right behind its big brother, the Hornet. It is unique in that no ship has even attempted to unseat the Gladiator in its role as a light bomber, likely because of it being so flexible even in that role. As a result, it is likely to remain the uncontested champion of carrier bombing for many years to come. I'd like to thank you for watching. I'd also like to thank those Patreons on screen now, whom, without their help, none of this would be possible. If you want to join them, the link is in the description. For as little as $5 a month, you get early access to videos, including a Times exclusive covering the entire history of the Star Citizen universe, whose first few episodes have been released to the public. Check them out now to see what $5 a month will get you. For now, let me know what you think about the Gladiator in the comments below. And as always, remember, Existoria at Astra.